Hello from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, where 250 years ago today, the Continental Congress started meeting in the building behind me, Carpenter's Hall. There'll be lots of celebrations here in Philadelphia for the significant milestone in American history. Norris, I'm the executive director of the Carpenters Company. We are the nonprofit organization that owns and operates Carpenters Hall, um, where the first Continental Congress took place 250 years ago. Uh, and in fact, today, September 5th, 1774, was the first day of the first Continental Congress. So we're excited to be here and to welcome you all um, and to partner uh, with the, the Postal Service on this uh, wonderful stamp um, unveiling. Um, it's all, 2024 is a momentous year for us for another reason. Uh, the Carpenters Company itself was founded in 1724. So this year also marks the 300th anniversary wow. of, of our organization. So we have um, two reasons to celebrate and to, to be with you all today. Um, On this very date of September 5th, when the First Continental Congress convened right here in this very building, Carpenters Hall. They met to decide how they should respond to increasingly hostile actions taken against them by the King and Parliament. Although coming from entirely different backgrounds, the delegates quickly unified around the adoption of the Articles of Association, in which they agreed not to import, export, or consume British goods. Although the outbreak of the war in April of 1775 soon overwhelmed this effort, the unity created by the First Continental Congress was best expressed by Delegate Patrick Henry of Virginia when he declared, quote, I am no longer a Virginian, but an American, end quote. 37,000 members are all direct descendants of the men and women who sacrificed to achieve American independence during the Revolutionary War. And we work today to honor our patriot ancestors by promoting patriotism, serving our communities, and educating and inspiring future generations about the founding principles of our country. We have counted among our members 16 presidents of the United States, including Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, Jimmy Carter, and George Bush, both of them. Winston Churchill, General Douglas MacArthur, and King Juan Carlos I of Spain were also sons of the American Revolution. We also had among our members a Philadelphian named Edwin O. Lewis, a president of the Pennsylvania SAR. He was the first president of the Independence Hall Association in 1942, and that group was instrumental in the creation of Independence National Historical Park, which we're all enjoying on this beautiful, today, beautiful day today. In his honor, the part of Independence Mall that between Arch and Market Streets is named after him. But the men who came to Philadelphia 250 years ago were mostly loyal subjects of King George III, who was definitely not a son of the American Revolution. <laughs> Those loyal subjects of the king asked him to address their grievances against the parliamentary government acting in his name, but they were not, at that time, committed to independence. The convening of the First Continental Congress was nonetheless a critical milestone on the road to independence. That road reaches back to the Stamp Act Crisis of 1765, the Boston Massacre of 1770, and the Boston Tea Party of 1773. As has been stated, Parliament's response to the Boston Tea Party led us directly to this date and to this place. When news reached the other colonies of the closure of the Port of Boston and the other acts known to us in America as the Intolerable Acts, the leaders of the other colonies immediately realized that if Britain could do that to Massachusetts, there was nothing stopping them from doing it to New Hampshire or South Carolina or any other colony. What had been largely a Massachusetts cause became an American cause. The delegates of the 12 colonies, as has been stated, only Georgia stayed away. Is there anyone here from Georgia? At least one from Georgia. Glad you made it today. You're 250 years too late. <laughs> But those delegates came as representatives of their individual provinces. They left with an emerging notion that they weren't just Virginians or Rhode Islanders, but Americans. And so from this place, the road to independence would lead to the Battle of Lexington and Concord the following April, the Battle of Bunker Hill, 
and the defense of Charleston, South Carolina in June, and right back here to that other nearby historic building now known as Independence Hall. And many of the loyal subjects of the First Continental Congress, including my cousin George, would become the rebels or the patriots who led the American Revolution. That revolution was a war unlike any other war of the 18th century. Rather than a fight for land or continental domination, it was fought for ideas and ideals. The ideal first among them was liberty or freedom. As the delegates themselves wrote, we asked for but peace, liberty, and safety. Of course, they did not mean that for everyone. They perhaps meant it indirectly for their wives and daughters, and they sort of meant it for indentured servants. But nearly all of them would not have meant it for those who were enslaved in America or the Native American population. But they set in motion forces that many of them did understand. By starting a nation on the idea of liberty and freedom, it was only a matter of time before that would have to apply to all of us. As our Constitution of 1789 states, our system of government was established in order to form a more perfect union. It was here that our imperfect union as a nation began in 1774, setting in motion those forces that have propelled Americans of every generation to try to make America better and more perfect. For that, we owe the delegates of the First Continental Congress our profound thanks, and it is most fitting to commemorate this milestone on our ongoing journey to an ever more perfect union with this beautiful new forever stamp. Thank you for allowing the Sons of the American Revolution to be a part of this great event. Thank you, Michael. Our final speaker is a man who really needs no introduction. Uh, he has many titles, um, author, publisher, scientist, inventor, ambassador, founding father, and uh, as we mentioned, the very first postmaster general here in the United States. Of course, I'm talking about the one and only Dr. Benjamin Franklin, so please welcome Benjamin Franklin. This gal is uh, worse than it looks. When I was told by the powers to be above, as they referred to earlier, that I was going to travel to some place I would like, and it was exciting. I said, Paris? They said, no. I said, London? No. And here I am in Philadelphia. But enjoyable town it is. My house was right across the street. I'm going to tell you a, bit, a little bit about my history in Philadelphia, and if you have any questions later, we can perhaps answer those. If you have any corrections, I want you to send this to the U.S. Postal Service <laughs> in Washington via the dead letter office. I came to Philadelphia at age 17 under the darkness of night, came down, down at the uh, base of Market Street, which would have been High Street at the time. I had been traveling for 10 days with no shower. My hygiene was bad. Came up the street 17, a woman came out of her uh, door, a woman named Deborah Reed. Perhaps you're familiar with it. But she laughed at me because I looked so bad. Can you imagine what that does to a man's self-esteem? She laughed at me, but I did get her back. I married her. <laughs> but I worked in Philadelphia for many, many years, as you may know, basically as a printer. That was my business. That was the way I made a living. And um, I, I franchised it. I was the first franchisor in America. Franchised it into the Caribbean. I would find people that worked hard for me and give them a franchise, award them a franchise someplace else take a portion of their compensation. Um, yes. Um, and it was uh, working that way that allowed me to retire at age 42. There are no Social Security. <laughs> I'm guessing not many of us can retire at age 42, but that's what I did. I went off to England and I, this is a mature crowd. This is a good looking mature crowd. Usually I'm in front of what looks like a pirate ship. But um, I retired and I'm going to use a word that may be offensive to some of you. The word at that time was agent. The word now would be lobbyist. <laughs> I worked as a lobbyist for America to, um, to Great Britain. And I was the postmaster general at that time while living in Great Britain. I guess that was the original work from home detail. <laughs> I, um, I did that and enjoyed it until 1774 when the letters I would send back to America were censored and were read by the king. Reminds me of a communist nation today, but they were read by the king and I was demoted and taken away. I was a, a crown sympathizer. I was not a Tory 
sympathizer, but I was a crown sympathizer. I wanted to keep us together. When I arrived back in, in America in 1774, shortly after the First Continental Congress, I was not at the First Continental Congress, after I had been blamed for the Boston Tea Party, I had an alibi. I was in England. <laughs> so I had nothing to do with it, as my wife said. I came back to America, I was immediately named president. Should be a correction there. I was named president of Pennsylvania. I hate it when school children ask me, which president were you? I have to hand them a civics book and we go on from there. But I was named president of Pennsylvania and a, a, a member of the Second Continental Congress in which we named, um, we made statutes that helped us win this war. We won the war, um, I considered it, and I don't mean to correct the delegates, it was not a declaration of independence. It was a declaration of dependence. It was one colony dependent upon 12, and 12 dependent upon one. Much like today, we don't do it without teamwork. It takes teamwork to get ahead, and it's that dependence that worked very well for us. I was then, um, I was then sent off. We had a war, but we had no way to pay for it. So I was sent off to France, and um, looking to them for money, I was, uh, it was a secret mission. And George Washington gave it to me in secret. And he said, don't tell anybody why you're there. And I said, well, what do I say why I'm there? George Washington looked at me and said, no man of any age needs an excuse to go to Paris. <laughs> so I went off to Paris and we did raise the money. And uh, we served as art director, designer, and typographer of this wonderful work of art. The stamp art, evocative of the US flag, is dominated by a vertical blue band bordered on either side by white stripes. The text at the top of the band reads, 12 colonies unite in protest. The center features the Congress's plea to King George III, which I read earlier. We ask but for peace, liberty, and safety. The title of the stamp, First Continental Congress, 1774, appears at the bottom. A red stripe with 12 white stars representing the number of colonies that participated in the Congress delineates the left side. Now at this time I would like to ask our participants to the stage for the official unveiling of the First Continental Congress Commemorative Forever Stamp. 